Today's sermon is a question to begin with, am I saved? Am I saved? It's a question I get a lot in pastoral ministry and evangelism when I do ministry outside the church, when I was at the prison you know, last week for prison ministry. This is a question that comes up, am I saved? And the continuation of the title for today, which I want you to focus on, is Ask Jesus, Not Friends. Ask Jesus, Not Friends. Am I saved? I don't remember some of the details, but I remember part of the experience very vividly, even though this is over 20 years ago. I'm a young pastor at the time. I'm a church planting pastor, my second pastor at after seminary, uh, developing a church that was growing a lot, had a whole lot of visitors coming to it, uh, a whole lot of professions of faith, adults coming to faith, a lot of baptism of adults. We love, in the Presbyterian Church, we love baptizing adults who come to faith. That's a great celebration. We had a lot of young families, young people coming, but in this church, which was in the metro Atlanta area, just north of what's called Alpharetta and south of a town called Cumming in North uh, Atlanta, North Metro Atlanta, uh, one woman, relatively young woman in her 30s, had been coming to church for a while. She was not a member of the church. She was married to a man who was skeptical and critical initially of the idea that she needed to come to church, that she wanted to have faith in Jesus. But then something interesting happened over the course of the fall. This was during a fall season. Uh, this man occasionally would attend with her, her husband. They'd only been married a short time. It was either his second or third marriage. As I recall, I would think I would place him in his late 30s at the time. Uh, a man of the world, a rough guy, a uh, big guy, strong, good-looking guy. Uh, but he had never been a Christian in his life, never been baptized, never had a faith background. But he started to come to church for worship with her sometimes. And then I remember that the Sunday before Thanksgiving, I was delighted to see this. The Spirit was obviously speaking to him. He wanted to talk with me and begin to pray with me after the church service that Sunday and said he believed that somehow God was communicating with him and, and that he was now open to finding out about Jesus and, and faith. And I rejoiced at that. And then I moved on to my obligations, my ministry obligations. In those days, being a church planner, you know, I was kind of out around in the community a lot. And that night happened to be up in Cumming, in the town of Cumming, they had a multi interdenominational Thanksgiving service on Saturday night at the First Baptist Church. First Baptist up there had just built a large sanctuary. I remember we were in that sanctuary. Um, I was participating in the worship service for the community Thanksgiving service at First Baptist. Several other pastors were there. I left that service. It was late, relatively late, probably 738. I'd been working all day. It's Sunday night. But for whatever reason, after talking to everybody after the service, doing the fellowship, the kind of the community outreach thing, I can't remember why. And I I do remember asking myself why I was doing it. Instead of going directly to my home and to Nancy and the young girls, our daughters, I decided I needed to go back a back road, a county road, back to where our new church building was. And as Nancy recalls it, we still had the, the, the trailer that I'd been working my office out. It was still physically up next to the brand new church building that God had provided for the new church to build. And I'm heading that direction and on this county road, Soon there would be subdivisions all along where I was driving, but not yet. And I was in a little bit of an isolated area. And I saw headlights and a vehicle overturned on the side of the road. Somebody had run over into a ditch. And I pulled over to stop to see what I could do, call 911 uh, to pray with whoever this was, this, this man. I saw it's a man lying, kind of moaning. Uh, very badly injured uh, to the side of the, the vehicle. I think he'd been thrown out of the vehicle. Uh, he, he was bleeding profusely. 
it was the same man, the one who, with whom I just prayed that morning. Now, he was in, as it turned out, the process of dying. He was taken about 10 minutes later by EMTs in an emergency vehicle to a local hospital where he died later that night, a few hours later. But in this time with him, when I was the only one there with him, and then some other people came up to see what they could do to help, I was holding this man's hand and praying with him, and he was very earnest. And he said he knew that God had been speaking to him. He had lived his life apart from God and apart from faith in Jesus. Uh, but God had already been speaking to him, and now he wanted to know, can I be saved? You know, I, I have not been part of God. I haven't been part of the church. Man, never been baptized, never, never a member of the church. And I said, absolutely. I, by the grace of God, served God and leading a whole lot of folks to know the Lord in, you know, the, the Fresh Start Center in my ministry as a deacon at First Presbyterian in Orlando, and now obviously as a church planter and as a pastor. I'd held church members' hands and non-church members' hands through death, you know, working in the Veterans Administration Hospital when I, well, I was a chaplain at the Veterans Administration Hospital when I was going through seminary. Uh, Owen Bissett, in my first month at Winter Haven before I came to this church that I was at now, a great saint of the Lord in his early 90s, held his hand, walked him through an hour or two of dying. But now this was a different situation. Let me ask you this. Do you think this man could be saved at this point? I had no water available to me of any significance. I certainly couldn't immerse him if you want immersion baptism. Um, he, he's, he's, he's bleeding to death. Can he be saved? Can you be saved? Well, talked him through the gospel in scripture, clarified what he was already asking about that morning, and he called on the name of the Lord Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Now, he died a couple hours later in the hospital. Was he saved? Was he not? He never sang in the choir, never was baptized, didn't have the particular logistical style of baptism you may think you've got to have, you know, to be saved. Didn't have any of that. I believe that by the grace of God, he is with Jesus equally as someone who spends their entire life glorifying God, and there's nothing against glorifying God. Let us now turn to Scripture as we ask Jesus, not friends, am I saved? Luke chapter 9, verse 35. We're back to this particular verse. I already looked at this verse last week to point out to you to break the preaching point that it's God's revelation, not human discovery and understanding that is the basis of our faith in Jesus. It's God's revelation, not what we figure out, okay? God's revelation. But I'm back to this scripture today, frankly, because uh, it's been raised by some of our youth, it just happens to be some of our youth who've been told by friends, pretty authoritatively by friends, um, middle school friends, early high school friends, you're not saved if you don't get baptized the way I got baptized and the timing I got baptized. So we're addressing this issue kind of prompted out of our youth, but I know for even for college students, for adults, for 18 year olds, for 88 year olds, sometimes there's a question of this burning issue. So to begin with Luke 9, 35, and a voice came from the cloud. This is the voice of the father at the time of the transfiguration. Remember this from last week's sermon, heaven on earth. Go back to heaven on earth for more exposition of this passage. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him, listen to him. That's the word from the Father in heaven, decisively at that turning point in Luke's gospel. Now. To another turning point, Jesus is being crucified. Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43. A criminal being crucified next to Jesus. Apparently no righteousness is in his own life. 
turns to Jesus in the early hours of the crucifixion and says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Amen, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And then to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For, quoting from Joel, chapter 2, Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Am I saved? Ask Jesus. Look to, and if you're working with the sermon notes, you've got a blank to fill in there. Look to Christ. You know what you put in there? Alone. Christ alone. Again, we're talking about God's revelation of his son and of the gospel through his son. The Father from heaven says, this is my son, the chosen one. Hear him. And then in verse 36, Jesus was found alone. We don't need Moses and Elijah. We don't need this or that instrumentality. Jesus is found alone. The whole focus is on Jesus. Your life and your salvation depend on Christ alone, but are fully given through Christ alone. Now, yes, Jesus mandated. Jesus himself is the Lord of the New Testament community of the church, mandated baptism and the supper. He did. He mandated them. And let me pause here to say, if you were baptized early in your life, I don't care if you're baptized as an infant or later in your life, let me remind you, we have the invitation and the opportunity always open for you to come and you, for you to come forward publicly and to reaffirm your faith and to renew your baptismal commitment. That's something that Jack Atkins one of our deacons did before the ordination service the first Sunday of this year. He came at the 8.30 service. He asked me if he could reaffirm his commitment. He said, when I was baptized as a teenager, I didn't know a whole lot of what was going on. Now that I'm being called to serve another term as a deacon, I really, as a matter of repentance and faith, want to reaffirm and be renewed in my baptism. And so we did that at the 8.30 service. That invitation is open. Teenagers, 88-year-olds, 42-year-olds like Jack, wherever you are in your life. And we love baptism. We love believers' baptism of adults, new people who are coming into the faith and bringing their households into the faith. We love a baptism of covenant children of believers as well. Now, Jesus baptized or calls us to baptize and calls us to invite to his supper. He mandated these things as outward expressions. That's what you fill in that blank. They're outward expressions, or more technical theological term, they're New Testament. In other words, covenant signs of believers' inner or spiritual union with Christ. The way you are saved is to be made one in Christ. This is what the New Testament is talking about all the time. Are you in Christ? You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. God joins you with Christ so that you live with Christ. But the sacraments, the baptism and the supper, are not. They are not, number one, conditions precedent to your salvation. They are not conditions precedent to your salvation. Nor are they performances that we need to add to the perfect person and work of Christ. To think that we need to add to Christ is, as Paul says, to miss or forfeit the gospel. Not only have you not understood the gospel, you've rejected the gospel. The gospel is in Christ alone. Jesus alone and his perfect work for your salvation 
is where you put 100% of yourself and your life and your trust. If you start trying to say, well, I've got Jesus, but I need to add something else on top of that, you've missed Jesus altogether, and you have rejected the gift that the Father wants to give you. This is my son, him alone. Listen to him. Trust in him. We're saved through the gospel in Christ. And that is a gospel that Christ accomplishes alone. Is the one mediator between God and man. Our perfect salvation, our perfect sacrifice, our perfect priest, our perfect prophet, our perfect king. They're not three or four kings. They're not three or four saviors. There's one. So, fill in the blanks, if you would, Christian. For by what you have been saved, through what? What is the source of your salvation, and what is the instrumentality of your receiving that source? The answer here is, you should know it, for by grace, in other words, by God's gift, by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith is not a production on your part, it's a reception of the gift. As Paul goes on and says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, and this is not your own doing. You don't prove your salvation. You don't prove to yourself. If you're looking to yourself for assurance or some logistics that were done in a sacerdotal manner, you've missed the gospel. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. I don't go around bragging about my sacraments, right? I don't go around bragging about my prayer life. I boast, I live, my faith is in Christ alone. We're not saved by outward performances. Now, teenagers and big adult people, I know we get distracted by outward performances and it seems really cool and powerful. It's smoke, if you're gonna treat it as salvation, it's smoke and mirrors. These are things that pass away. We're not saved by outward performance or by the dispensation of elements. The grace and the salvation are not through the dispensation of elements. The elements are a sign of the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? So we're not saved through circumcision, physical circumcision. We're not saved through baptismal water. I don't have to fly everybody over to the Jordan River to get you baptized over there to just make sure. Well, let's baptize you eight times in the Jordan River just to make sure. No, no, no. And not by the wine or, or, or the juice. But by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to God's glory alone. God gets the whole glory of your salvation. You start adding yourself or somebody who did something for you into this, we've missed the gospel. God's glory alone. So it was mid to late morning on Good Friday, and even the people who loved Jesus who were hanging around kind of in the background of the crucifixion, folks like his mom, Mary, Mary Magdalene, John, his cousin, the apostle, they love Jesus, but it's, it's done. You know, they're devastated. The whole thing is turned upside down. Jesus is dying. He's being crucified. Can you believe it? He, we thought he was the Messiah. Mary's like, I, I know he's like supposed to be who he is, but this is devastating. You read the Gospels. Nobody is like holding a worship service in celebration of Jesus' crucifixion. They are heartbroken. They are devastated. There is one man, the one man on earth, common man, uh, in, in addition to Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, one man who believed the dying Jesus was the Lord of the coming kingdom. And who was that? The greatest rabbi of his age. The guy who had the best circumcision ever because he was circumcised by the greatest rabbi of his age. Yes? No. The choir leader. The Preacher type. I mean, what, what? No, no, no. It's a horrible criminal who's being crucified next to Jesus. But somehow, by the grace of God, by the Spirit of God, this man is the one man who trusts in Jesus even as Jesus is dying on the cross. One man in the whole story who believed Jesus was Lord of the coming kingdom. And only one man asked Jesus. Everybody's asking their friends and Religious authorities, what's going on? Everybody's, you know, despairing and turning to each other. Let me remind you, the invitation is to ask Jesus what is happening in your life and to save you. 
So this one man, one, one guy who asked Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, what an affirmation of faith. Now notice this is not, this is a, he's turning to Jesus and saying this. This is not a big public affirmation. Nor does Jesus stop the crucifixion. He is the son of God. He does have authority to do this and say, well, wait a minute. This guy is not going to be saved unless I can have a really good baptism with him. So we're going to stop the crucifixion. I'm going to come down for a few minutes. And John, come on over here. Would you please baptize this guy so we can make sure? No. Jesus authoritatively says, immediately, Amen. I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, the rabbis thought there were all different levels. You can read this in Mishnahic uh, writings. All different levels of paradise. And, you know, kind of like some of y'all would not be at the higher end of paradise, probably. You know, just kind of looking at our lives. Um, and then some people are, there's no way they're going to be in paradise. This guy, there's no way he's even in the lowest level of paradise um, to come. But Jesus says, no, you're going to be directly with me. Like, at the highest end, because you're with me in the age to come. And it happens now. Now, you could say to me, well, perhaps we don't know this, but hey, he's being crucified next to Jesus, probably, probably a Jew, probably under the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, fine, let's go outside the Mosaic Covenant. Jesus, in his teaching, in his disputation with the Sadducees in Holy Week, is questioned by the Sadducees about the resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection. Jesus, in showing them from the scripture how the Old Testament, the scripture, the Torah that they hold to, Sadducees are only into Torah. Jesus quotes from Torah and says, you know, have you not read in the scriptures, you know, at the burning bush, that the Lord, when he declares himself, declares himself the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? who all live to him. In other words, they are all alive. They're all risen in eternal communion with God. That's what Jesus is saying in Luke chapter 20, verses 37 and 38. But none of those guys are baptized. And that's outside the Mosaic Covenant. Now, let's look back to the story of Abraham, or Abram, as he's named at the time, in Genesis chapter 15 not yet circumcised and certainly not baptized, Abram, a former idolater who's been called by God, Genesis 15, believed God's covenant promises to himself and to his children, to his descendants. And God accounted that faith in the promises as righteousness. How is he accounted righteous? Well, this is the gospel already in motion. In Reformed theology, this is called the covenant of grace. It's already at work. The only way he can be credited with righteousness that is not his own is from Christ. And in fact, Jesus says in John 8 that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in my day. Abraham already sees ahead to Jesus and trusts in him. It's amazing. And this is way before Abraham is even circumcised. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 4. He talks about it in Galatians. Uh, you can read that. Paul really makes this big emphasis that it's much later in Abraham's life. We get it in Genesis 17 when Abraham is finally given the outward sign of this covenant relationship with God. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign. Notice that a sign of the covenant between me and you. And, okay, so Abraham is doing it as an adult believer, right? And, by the way, everybody in his household is commanded to be circumcised. Oldest to the youngest, male. And then he goes on, the Lord goes on and says, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. In other words, there's no way you have a believer's circumcision at that point. Abraham's justification and salvation is given by God, grace through faith, long before Abraham's outward sign of being claimed by God in the circumcision. Also, notice this. His son, Yitzhak, or Isaac, and his grandson, Yaakov, Jacob, were each circumcised as infants. But later in their lives, they call on the name of the Lord and are saved. But they don't get re-circumcised. There's not some second operation that needs to happen because the faith and the salvation are in union with God 
They're not about the outward sign. What about when Jesus talks about being born of the water and the spirit? I referred to this passage last week, not knowing I was going to preach on this today in John chapter 3, verse 5. Yes, Jesus, in discussion with Nicodemus, who comes to him, the member of the Sanhedrin, the teacher of the law, uh, Jesus says, you must be born from above, born again, born of heaven, uh, John 3, 3. And Nicodemus comes back and starts talking about basically introducing the issue of two types of birth, the physical birth and the spiritual birth, because he's getting that Jesus is talking about something else. And he says, I, you can't enter your mom's womb a second time. And then Jesus comes back and says, look, not only can you not see without being born from above, you, there's no way you're going to enter without being born of water and the spirit. What's he talking about? At one level here, obviously anybody who can read can figure out or knows about life can figure out, okay, he, he, apparently at one level he's talking about amniotic fluid, water, you know, physical birth, and then the spiritual birth that's clearly needed for the entrance into the kingdom. But at a deeper level, and Nicodemus is somebody who knows the Bible. So Jesus is clearly also pointing him over to the New Testament, the new covenant prophecy of Ezekiel. Specifically, Ezekiel 36. Born of water in the Spirit. Yes, this is where God speaks to this. Ezekiel 36. I, God says, will sprinkle water on you. In other words, just like in the old Mosaic covenant, the blood is sprinkled to show that the people are under the covenant. Now there will be a sprinkling of water with this prophecy of the new covenant. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will put my Spirit within you. That's God's New Testament, New Covenant promise of the water and the Spirit. <laughs> but these are spiritual messages from God. Paul goes on and says in Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. you got to understand this. The real circumcision is not the outward body thing. But a Jew is one inwardly, Paul says, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The same substance for the covenant of grace. In the old, it's the sign, the outward sign is the circumcision. In the new, it's the baptism. But either way, as God calls his people in the Old Testament, he says, circumcise then your hearts. The issue is the baptism of your heart for us, okay? It's a matter of the Holy Spirit in you. And stiffen your neck no more. And then again in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. He's not talking about a physical operation, surgery going on here. He's talking about a spiritual thing. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children, your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and, with all, and that you may live. One more in Jeremiah 9 verse 25 behold the days are coming declares the lord when i will punish all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh for us i will punish those who have the water baptism on the outside but they're not truly in my son that's the parallel so paul says a jew is not is one inwardly circumcision is a matter of the heart by the holy spirit not by the letter and because of that one who is truly in the Lord, the praise is solely to Jesus, to the Lord, not to what I did or what I had done to me. Paul goes on and says, speaking about the priority of his ministry, this is interesting, in 1 Corinthians 1, I thank God that I baptized none of you. They're, they're debating about which baptism is right and who needs to baptize you and how you need to get baptized. I, I thank God that I, I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, Oh, yes, I, I did baptize the household, in other words, the entire family of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. And then Paul goes on and says this, For Christ did not send me to baptize. Now, this is the apostle to the Gentiles. This is the guy who spreads Christianity over the main part of the Roman Empire, right? Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Praise in Christ alone. So how do you come to him? How do you ask Jesus? You come as a child. Luke 8, 18, verses 15 through 17. Luke 18. Now, they were bringing even infants to him. Can you believe it? Infants to him, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. 
But Jesus called them to himself, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. A man, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. There's your entrance. There's your challenge. Are you saved? Well, here's the gospel for us. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved because everyone who truly calls on the name of the Lord, trusting only in him, a new life only in him, will be saved. Ask Jesus. I want you to know the love, the joy of being relieved and released from human anxieties and declarations. I want you to know the saving joy and power and love of belonging to Jesus and him only. Everyone who calls on his name will be saved, and he secures that for you. Trust, believe in him. Keep your heart set on him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.